grayest skies to live in color you have called us in your life your light uncovered the world we will see now you Christian Church. It is good to worship with one another. I'm glad that you're here worshiping with us on site or joining us online. I want to remind you if you're worshiping online to gather your worship supplies, such as uh, if you got a Bible handy or if you want to have your communion supplies ready to go so that you're fully participatory in this morning's service as it happens before you here live online. Uh, folks who are with us here in person want to issue the reminder to keep that mask up over your beak fully and completely while we're gathered together here in worship. Beak is a medical term, and as a professional, that's why I use it. Um, folks, uh, whatever has happened in the days prior to our gathering here in person and online, all of the life that has transpired and the ugh, ugh that's a, another technical term, you're welcome. <sighs> We bring it before God as we worship, and we trust that God uh, sort of catches us midair and, and holds us, and God is a breath of life. And so as we tell the story of Jesus, Christ resurrected, inviting us to life, uh, it's a reminder in worship uh, that those arms of God are there catching us, that that presence of God is there comforting us and guiding us. And we celebrate that in worship and bring God our praise because of it. Let's pray together. Lord of life, of mercy and compassion, we, we call upon your spirit this morning in worship. We bring you our full selves. We bring our praise and our gratitude. We bring the things that have not added up the way that we thought. We bring our sin and our self-service and seek your forgiveness. And God, we know that you are near. And so it's that nearness that we worship. And we give you thanks. Amen. Saturday was silent, surely it was through. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? 
Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Hope in the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Pentecostal fire is stirring something new. You're not going to run out of miracles anytime soon. Resurrection power runs in my The praise make a dead man walk again. Hope in the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling.
Jesus' name, let's sing that out. this time.
no one like you. Good morning, friends. Welcome to the very last Sunday here in the month of January. Uh, and so we are five weeks in a row of looking at things that have been said to or about Jesus and interactions with Jesus sometimes. Sometimes Jesus is not present in the situation like we're going to read about this morning. Uh, but what we've been studying up on are these sort of moments of the holy, these experiences that people have had where they've been talking to Jesus or about Jesus, where something substantive and significant has happened. And looking at these quotations and figuring out what's in this that we can take away. This morning we're going to read from the second chapter of the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a big deal. It is really what takes place after Jesus is no longer on the scene, and it's the formation of the church. So early in the book of Acts we get the Pentecost. And the Pentecost is a really shortened version. Is uh, All these folks from all over the place have gathered together in Jerusalem and crazy breaks out. And the Spirit of God descends, as it's described in the book of Acts, like tongues of fire. And suddenly people who could uh, only speak their language are suddenly understanding things that are being said in other languages, and it represents this just explosion of the capacity of the reach of the church that had up until that point been confined by sort of geography and language and culture. And now suddenly those barriers aren't there anymore, and so the Pentecost is the birth of the church. So this happens, it's not so. people go, what's going on? These people must be drunk, and then Peter has one of the greatest lines in all of Scripture, they're not drunk as you, command, as you assume, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning, and then he goes on to explain what the heck is going on. He gives the explanation of what's going on. He gives the explanation of the ministry of Jesus and how all of that came into fruition, And as soon as he gets done giving this lengthy explanation, we get these words from the second chapter of Acts, verses 37 through 42. And a very important question is posed. After all this information has been thrown at them, they they wonder, well, what, what do we do? Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and prayers. Well, what should we do? I mean, what do we do? Uh, we are very familiar with this question, right? What do we do? What are we supposed to do? What should we do? We ask this question regularly, and sometimes we play up in our minds what we would do. Sometimes we ask the question because a scenario has presented itself that we've just never dealt with before or don't deal with frequently enough to know what to do. 
So we asked, what should we do? You know, it's a common question that comes up when I work with folks after somebody has died. What do we do? You know, I mean, as a pastor, I, I go to a whole lot more funerals than most of y'all do. And so it's common for people to not know. I mean, do we call, who do we call? Do we call the, the life insurance company? Do we call the funeral home? Or do they expect us? Are they going to call us? And, you know, what do we do? There's all these questions, not having frequently dealt with all of the details that can come of taking care of someone and memorializing their life. I've often posed the question, what do we do, you know, in the, in the certainty that the Mitchells win the lottery? You know, like, what, what do we do? Well, I know, I have run that scenario, right? I'm going to call our financial advisor. We're going to get him on a plane down here to our house, right? We're going to call our attorney and figure out what to do. We've got to figure out, are we in one of those states where everybody finds out who we are? Or can we remain anonymous? We've got to answer that question. Okay, what are, what are we going to do? Well, Jeremiah Donati, the athletic director at TCU, I'm going to have to call him because, you know, uh, I don't want to make friends with, with him, get myself, get myself some good seats. Um, what? I, he would absolutely be like the fourth phone call. <laughs> what do we do? Right? And that's sort of fanciful and fun. What do we do? It's a, a question we pose like even in mundane circumstances, you know, ordinary day-to-day stuff. Uh, we were cooking a new recipe uh, a couple of weeks ago. You know, because you cook the same seven things over and over again, and then you intersperse those seven things with leftovers and going out to eat, right? Or is that just my house? We cook the same stuff over and over again. So somebody gave us a new recipe. Yes! All right, so we're going to try it out. Not too hard, and I'm there at the stove, browning meat, browning meat, and it just started to stank. I mean, just a high heaven. And I will not use the specific terminology of what it smelled like. I'll just say it is common, you know what it is, and you don't like it. But I won't say it from this microphone in this church service, but it smelled bad. And so I think the meat had turned, and so then when dinner doesn't work out, right? When it burns, or it tastes gross, or it smells bad. You know, in a mundane circumstance like fixing supper, we ask the question, when it doesn't go right, well, now what are we going to do? Okay, well, we're going to go out to eat, which is not the worst thing in the world. And there's an easy solution to that question. And so we're, we're familiar with posing this question like we find in this morning's scripture. Okay, well, what should we do? Sometimes with a lot of consequence to the answer. Sometimes, you know, okay, we'll run to Chipotle. Not as major of a circumstance. But we often forget to pose a question like this one. When God moves... We can sometimes forget to just stop and ask the question in the presence of God. So what should we do? We can get into ruts of faith that are punctuated more by like periods than question marks. Where we're offering a whole lot more statements than we are submitting inquiries. But if we look back at what we've studied over the course of the month of January, there's something critical to every one of these passages that we've read when people have been talking to or about Jesus, when this experience of something holy and substantial has happened. There is a through line that goes in every one of these passages that we read when somebody was talking to or about Jesus. They're all marked by questions. They're all marked by inquiries. It started the first Sunday of this month. The first Sunday of this year was Jesus posing the question to his disciples and in a sense to us, who do you say that I am? And it's in the answer to that question that we really get the bedrock of our church and our tradition. Well, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. Right? It's in that question that is posed to the disciples and the answer that they give that something substantial and holy happens. In the next week, we looked at the walk to Emmaus, and it's post-resurrection. And these fellows are sullen and sorrowful walking along from Jerusalem to Emmaus, trying to process what had gone on, and they happen upon Jesus. They don't know it's Jesus. And they're bummed out, and Jesus says, man, what's going on? Remember, it's Jesus in the mustache and glasses and the nose. They don't know it's him. What's going on? What are you talking about? 
And so there's, there's this question from Jesus, but there's the question from them back to Jesus. Are you the only person in town who has not heard what is going on? And it's in these questions and the answers that are exchanged that something holy and substantive happens. And later we find out the description as they sit down for their meal that Christ was revealed before them in the breaking of the bread. Uh, Reverend Wright preached for us, uh, offering words of insight on doubting Thomas. Right, and Thomas doesn't ever like expressly like go into detailed questions, but there is a question at the heart of he wasn't really here, right? I mean, no, I don't know. He wasn't here, right? Was he really here? And then something substantial and holy and nourishing happens in the presence of the reappearing Jesus as he sort of just shows up into the locked room. Last week it was this healing experience that the possessed man in the temple had. And he cried out to Jesus, What have you to do with us, Jesus? What are you doing here and what does it mean for us? And this morning's question, right, on the heels of the Pentecost, on the heels of this detailed description of what people could know about God through the person and ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Peter gives this soliloquy, and then they pose the question, they were cut to the heart, and they, they got to know, well, what should we do? Questions and inquiries that are critical to these moments of holy that people are having, these, these substantial moments of realizing something powerful about God. Now, the book of Acts comes with the physical absence of Jesus. Right? We get the book of Acts, and we thought all this Jesus stuff lead up to this point, but he's no longer right there on the scene. He's no longer verbally communicating with people. And so for Christians, the book of Acts represents something substantial. It represents a shift in responsibility. The transmission of the gospel is no longer the responsibility of Jesus himself walking around, you know, performing miracles, calling disciples, telling stories, preaching on hillsides. He's not doing that stuff anymore. The book of Acts represents a shift in responsibility, and the transmission of the gospel is now incumbent upon us, the church. And it can be tempting. It can be tempting to interpret that as making more statements than we make inquiries, offering more proclamations. I've got it all figured out. Rather than offering questions like, what do we do? What have you to say to us, Jesus? Who do you say that I am? When we read today's passage, it can make us think that we need to, you know, be really good and faithful and be like Peter, right? Climb up on that stump and holler out to everybody, here's what's going on, I know the answers, I've got the solutions, listen to me. It can be tempting to zero in on Peter's speech and spotlight him as the person we're supposed to be like from this story. I've got to be like him, got to make the proclamation, say it clearly and certainly so everybody knows. And to a degree, that's the case, but that's not exclusively the case. Peter, for all the good that he does, has a faith that is marked by a whole lot more periods and exclamation points than it is by question marks. And we're not going to find answers. I know this is going to come as a great shock. If we're not asking questions, right? We're not going to discover new insights if we're not yielding ourselves to be humble enough to inquire. What are we going to do? What should we do? There, There is something happening that you need direction on. There is somebody with whom you're trying to reconcile. There are dynamics in the household that are strained. 
There are phone calls that you've been letting go to voicemail. Right? We all live in this moment where we've got these situations asking what should we do. I hope that you understand that as an act of faith. Not as an act of weakness. Not as some sign of like, I should have it more figured out than I do, but I don't, and someday. There's something holy in just pausing to yield ourselves to God, to inquire, to ask. This morning's question nudges. This morning's question, it, what are we going to do? What should we do? It nudges the clutter out of the way. And it makes room to hear. Pausing for this question, what should we do, God? Breathing deeply and patiently to, I don't know, let God answer it. It forges a moment of recreation, of resurrection. Pausing for this question, God, what should we do? It is faithful. It's fulfilling. It's humbling. It's energizing. What should we do? So we're just going to stop. We're going to pray. So I invite you to that moment of pause. To ask the question, to at least for this moment, let the question nudge the clutter out of the way. God, what, what do we do? Trusting that there is an answer. Trusting that in our patience, God will reveal it. Trusting that the transmission of the gospel that the world needs right now is in part due to the questions that we ask. God, what should we do? What, what should we do? Amen. Y'all, it is good to be the church. It is good to be gathered under proclamation and inquiry, to be gathered under the lordship of Jesus and to give our lives to, to this calling. And so we want to offer the invitation that if you'd like to join First Christian Church in membership and ministry, you can do that by finding myself or Reverend Wright sometime soon, and we would love to celebrate that with you. You can contact us through the church office. And we're reminding the rest of our church friends here, your invitations matter. Call somebody. Call somebody, text somebody, let them know that you would love for them to be a part of your church experience. Your invitation matters. Our lives devoted to Christ together matter. Let's continue in worship as we sing. from your heart Canyons of mercy so deep I could never depart Father your wonders are endless Open my eyes to believe Awake my soul Let everything that has breath praise the Lord let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. With all of my heart, with all of my strength, with all that I have, I will sing. Let everything that has breath praise the Faithful. 
I was at a wedding of a dear friend. It was one of those, you don't know what side to sit on because you're friends with both of them. And I, and one of the first things that they did after they said, I do, was serve communion to their closest 200 family and friends. That's what they did. That was their moment of what do we do next? We come to the table and share this with our family and friends. That was one of the most special moments of their life. And today is a Sunday in January. Could be a special day for you. But no matter what, when you gather around this table, it is that incredibly special experience with God where you can taste and experience the unending grace. So as you come to this table, may you know that this is a special moment, no matter what. And this is what you do. Let us pray. As we pray, as we gather together at this table, we ask, Lord, please teach us to receive your word in our daily life and to truly live out a baptized life. Let us follow your teachings, have fellowship, have holy communion to commemorate you and to pray daily. May the Lord give us more strength. We thank you and pray in the victorious name of Jesus. Amen. On the night that Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room, he took what was in front of him, a simple loaf of bread, and blessed it and broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, in the same way, he took the cup, blessed it, and poured it and said, This is the cup of grace and the cup of the new covenant. Every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. All are invited to come to this table and your table at home. You are not here. 
There's never been a moment you were forgotten. You are not hopeless. But you have been broken, your innocence stolen. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your whispers, your whispers. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night it's you I will rescue there is no distance that cannot be covered over and over you're not defenseless I'll be your shelter I'll be your armor I hear you Underneath you, I hear your whistles, your whistles. I will send an army to find you in the middle of the dark, night and dark. Send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue. Friends, I want to give a word of gratitude for the generosity of this church that comes alive uh, to make the work and ministry that we do really thrive and impact people's lives. Uh, in a turn of events, it was a surprise to, I mean, practically everyone. Uh, our congregation ended the 2020 fiscal year just barely in the black. Like, your giving and generosity just blew people away that were tracking the numbers and taking care of our, our spending and, and making sure that we were being as in line as we could. I don't know if anybody heard, but 2020 was a very kind of off year, not quite, not quite what everybody was used to. And so the generosity and the faithfulness and your response as a congregation to fund the ministry that we have done together has just been 
astounding and, and it's a beautiful testament to, to your commitment to this church. As we look ahead to the year that is before us, that giving is all the more important because we're going to see a second half of 2021 that hopefully looks a lot different than the first half and we're going to want to be ready to just jump and sing and welcome people into this place and do ministry that's going to impact lives. And so while you're here on Sunday mornings and when you're worshiping with us online, we hope that you'll make use of your opportunities of the offering tray coming in or out of worship and your online giving opportunities at fccmckinney.org to continue your faithful generosity of tithes and offerings because incredible things are going to happen with the gifts that we give and they've already been happening and I'm just grateful that we all get to be a part of it together. Friends, we're going to pray and you have things that you are wondering about and we encourage you to share those things with your pastoral staff, uh, with shepherding elders, with our prayer team, you can do that through our prayer page at fccmckinney.org. Please head that way and share the things that you'd like somebody else to pray about. We're going to yield ourselves in a moment of quiet and just come before the presence of God, knowing that God is near, God hears us, and God receives us. Friends, let's pray. God, you do all things well and make all things new. And so we long for your resurrecting spirit at work within each of us, your resurrecting spirit at work within this church, that our collective response to your call would be to serve a world in need, that our collective response would be to forgive, to invite, to share, and to patiently wait God, we call upon your spirit as people whose hearts ache, as people whose next steps maybe are unclear, as people with much to celebrate and a whole lot of gratitude to bring, we call upon your spirit. While there are moments for us to proclaim, God, let us not forget that there are moments to simply inquire and to wait and to wonder and that it is holy to pause before you with hearts open to receive your word. What then should we do, God? Speak to your church. Speak to your children. Let us hear you. God, we pray for people who are sick and sad and lonely and need your love. And we pray that you would use us to be kind and generous and patient and loving. That you would activate within us a spirit of Christ to forgive and to seek forgiveness. To admit our our need for your forgiveness of the sin that we have conducted and, and the sin that sometimes we struggle to confess. But God, we know that you are before us in broken bread and shared cup, calling us to life now and eternal. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray to you and offer to you the words that he teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A couple of uh, announcements before we let you go. Uh, 2021 numbered giving envelopes are here in both services. Uh, Let us know if we need to hand deliver them to you. Disciples Crossing is having uh, weekend retreats, but they're only for one day. Uh, The deadline for 6th through 12th graders is this coming up Saturday, so make sure that you uh, sign up. This afternoon, if you've got nothing on your plate, uh, we are uh, having a 
movie discussion at 5 o'clock. Watch ahead of time, so maybe you need to this afternoon. Watch ahead of time, Knives Out. It's a great movie. I watched it last night. It's got exciting murder mystery. It's got fun things. It's got twist endings. And uh, our big final question will be, do we see any biblical themes in this uh, story? So start thinking. Think about it. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, if you have worshiped with us today and you start to experience any COVID-19 symptoms, we please ask that you contact the church office so we can continue to keep our community safe and healthy. With that all being said, I invite you to receive this benediction. Go from these places, worships, places and spaces of worship, empowered by God, encouraged by others, redeemed by Christ, and guided by the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. You have come and we have found life everlasting. Now alive, know your free. See